August 1st, the NHL finally returns after a very long break of over four months. My panel and I are going to break down the upcoming qualifying and playoff rounds, as well as the state of the league as a whole. I am joined by Brendan Balsamo, Ryan Clayton, and Chris Russo. Gentlemen, how are we doing, and are we ready to talk some hockey? Doing great, yeah. Finally getting it back up. Can't wait to see hockey again. It's been too long. Way too long. Yeah, same here. Uh, very happy to talk some hockey. Uh, happy that hockey's coming back. Um, and yeah, just in general, trying to do uh, trying to do my best during uh, quarantining and stuff. It's not been easy for anyone. So, gentlemen, I have a calendar in my room. It's an erasable calendar, and you know, of course, I do not have much going on. So, in the last week and a half, it's been July twenty third. It said baseball in all caps. And August 1st, it says hockey in all caps. So let's get this on. All right. Hockey is the last sport to finally get started. August 1st, like we said. Um, but they've been practicing for a while. Teams were in facilities as of uh, June. They had at one point, they had about a 9.5% positive COVID test rating, which is pretty high. Um, as of recently, they're down to about two positive cases out of 800 tests. So do you guys think that the NHL did a good enough job of keeping these players safe during these unprecedented times? Brendan, I'll start uh, with you. I think they're doing a great job. And I think that the bubble is a really good tactic because we've seen it work for the NBA. And now we're starting to see the non-bubble tactic fall through for the MLB. And, you know, they just got to the bubble, but um, they, they did a good job of, of containing it and keeping it in the teams in, in their respective spots before – uh, traveling to their hub cities. So I think from here on out, it can only probably only get better. I think they did an excellent job. Uh, you know, I, I thought they were perhaps going to play these games in two spots in the United States. Uh, however, it makes sense considering quarantine regulations and, you know, passport regulations uh, it, it, or customs regulations that they're going to play two in Canada. A lot of this is, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, thanks should be doled out to the actual players who, who quarantine themselves because, you know, these people are, these guys are traveling all over the world. They're, you got players from Sweden, Finland, Canada, U S Norway, Russia, uh, Germany, you guys got guys all over the Northern hemisphere. Uh, and on top of that, you know what? I, once again, I expected it to be two cities in the U S but I'm, I'm happy that they're doing it in Canada because so many players, even though there are players throughout the world and there's a big population of, of NHL players in the U.S., Canada, it's the Canada sport, and there are so many guys that probably went home to Canada, and it makes so much more sense. It makes it a lot easier uh, for them to play those games up there. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Chris, uh, on a lot of different points. Uh, I think uh, bringing up the geography and where they were doing this uh, is very interesting. But overall, with the league, I thought that they did an initial good job of shutting down the league. I thought that process was, in general, handled very well. Uh, I think it was taken with the utmost uh, sincerity. And everything then, uh, as you guys said, has been I've been pretty impressed with. So overall, good job by the NHL. I think uh, Bettman is starting to prove something a little bit because, you know, <laughs> everyone's given him all the hate the past couple of years. And now... Now he's starting to prove himself as a top two commissioner, probably. I think top two is a fair, fair grade there. I mean, um, yeah, because Adam Silver is doing a great job with NBA, and then right. Goodell and Manfred are just disgraces. So. <laughs> That's putting it lightly. <laughs> yes, lightly. Um, I think, I mean, some – originally I was a little nervous about the NHL because there were several teams that had to shut down their facilities. Um, but I think – those teams followed protocols set in place by the league and got it wrapped up pretty quickly without a big outbreak occurring for these teams. I mean, St. Louis had to close down Tampa Bay did because they had a couple of cases, but you know, they kind of handled it pretty well. And now that the teams are finally in the bubbles, I think it'll be hopefully smooth sailing from here. The NBA has been so far so good. I'm hoping the same for hockey. Um, and the hockey bubble looks a lot nicer from the pictures I saw on Instagram mm -hmm. yesterday. But moving over to the actual play itself, I mean, these teams haven't been together very long practicing, and obviously they had such a long layoff. Do you think the level of play is going to be up to par? Do you think it's going to be playoff hockey like we're used to seeing, or is it going to be kind of 
early, what typically would be early in the season kind of scrappy hockey. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Well, you know what? It's going to be, I think it's going to be a little easier for the eight teams that are playing the round robin games to adjust because the games matter. Of course, it's going to matter for playoff seeding, but it's a little like a preseason because regardless, they're going to be in the top four and, you know, none of these are going to be elimination games. It's going to be a little easier for them. Regardless, I think these teams, all these guys understand what's going on. You're still for the Stanley Cup. And I, I don't think it really makes a huge difference. I think these guys know where they're going. They know what it's going to be. It's going to be really different without the fans because fan, uh, believe me, the fans are as big – uh, a difference maker in the NHL playoffs as in the Stanley cup playoffs as they are for any other sport. But I think you're going to have about as good a level of play as possible. And if not, the quantity will probably offset that a little bit when you consider you get 24 teams and you get an extra round of games. Right. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think we will see in general, the level of play be kind of standard for playoff hockey. Um, watching the, I know they're two different sports, uh, the NBA being a little more of an individual sport, but watching the NBA, I mean, those players have looked the same. I think the biggest thing with the NAL is early on, we might see more just like more emphasis on line changes to make sure that players are fresh and stuff. So to start out, I mean, it's kind of going to be like normal play where the teams who have the better depth will probably prosper more. I'm expecting to see a bit more offense because I feel like if anyone's behind, if we see sloppy play, defenses will pay for it. And goalies have to be considering the offenses that are in the Stanley Cup playoffs at the moment. Goalies have to be on all the time. And because it's now like early season, um, we're not going to see goalies be consistently on. We're not going to see like a Holtby or a Lundqvist or, or a Price or even Mark andre Fleury like show up in the playoffs who day in, day out, shut out one goal, two goals max. Um, so I'm expecting to see a little bit more offense, which overall might be kind of better for viewership. I think that's a good point. Um, I think goalies will be very interesting to watch just kind of how have they, cause their bodies are so important. Their lower halves, especially have they been able to train by themselves? Are they getting across the crease as well as usual? How are they flashing the pads, flashing the glove? I think that's going to be really important as you said, in terms of goal scoring, but I'm a little skeptical about the play being up to standard. I mean, I've been to the past couple of years of opening day hockey in the regular season, and it's pretty sloppy. I mean, I've seen four goal leads disappear. I've seen just really not the level of play that you would expect by the time the playoffs come around. So in my mind, that's kind of something I'm a little nervous about, just that it's going to be more like you're just getting back together. You're still trying to mesh with the chemistry because you haven't seen these guys in over four months. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily going to be as crisp offensively, um, I understand defensively it's probably not going to be the same either. So it'll be interesting to see if these players can play at the playoff standard that the Stanley Cup usually provides. Um, but moving, Chris, you kind of mentioned the format. Um, do you think that the, the format provided, the top four seeds are playing seeding rounds, um, that kind of the games don't mean as much, and then the lower eight seeds are playing the qualifying um, series. Do you think this benefits, Chris, you kind of alluded to it, that you think it benefits the lower seeds. Do you guys all agree? Is there a little disagreement? Um, what do you guys think? Well, I would say, well, first off, I initially I don't think I would have uh, actually made those top four seeds play because I, I would have just put them where they were because, you know, the qualifying seeds – you know, you look at Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is locked in at five. They didn't have to play extra games in order to play as the five seed. Uh, but I do understand why they're doing it so they can make sure that these top four teams are not, you know, completely coming in rusty. Uh, I would say there's a slight, you know, it could go either way. I, I don't think there's a real uh, advantage in total for either, for either the, the top four seeds or the bottom eight. Because the bottom eight, you're going to play really meaningful hockey, and you're already going to be in that mindset 
of playoff hockey because the qualifying round really is a, an extra playoff round. It's a playoff round. It's not like, you know, it's going to be Bruins, Caps, Lightning, and Flyers playing each other in a round robin. That's not playoff hockey exactly. It's just to determine seeding. But in that case, it's, it is going to be a little easier and a little more lax. So it really depends on the mindset of each team and, you know, how you uh, are going to approach each of these things. I don't think there's a real advantage, but there can be, you know, certain psychological advantages depending on how each team approaches it. Yeah, um, I do think the point of mindset is going to be key, but I honestly have to give the advantage to the top four because of the buys. They have more time to rest. Um, You know, we have seen before in the NFL sometimes when they get buys through the wild cards and being top seeds and stuff that sometimes teams there don't perform or lose games. But I think with the buys, I think that's going to allow teams to, as we talked about earlier, like develop that chemistry, work back up that chemistry and stuff. So I think the top four are going to, uh, I think the top four are going to perform better. Um, Also too, I thought about this. I don't think the, uh, Chris, you would probably know this better than anyone, but has the NHL ever had like a wild card, like uh, buys and stuff for the playoffs? Oh, you mean a, 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 a tournament this big? Yeah. No, I don't believe so. I It used to be, well, until when it was the original six, it was just a four-team tournament. And then I think it went to eight when they went to the original 12. I don't think it's ever been more than 16 teams in a tournament. All right. Chris Russo, that was the case, but... knowledge. <laughs> Russo always there with the knowledge. So thank you for that. I, I thought I knew the answer, but yeah. Thank you, Russo. You're welcome. Um, I agree with Russo on this one because playing for your life is so different than playing for a seed. Uh, it's so – and plus, when you have – say you get a, a straight sweep of the first round, getting hot and taking that momentum into the second round is so much different than having played not meaningless games, but – games that you're not really fighting for your life for. Uh, We've seen so many teams getting hot at the right time make a run. And I think um, the top four seeds not playing meaningful games, meaningful games, uh, will make them more susceptible to teams that got hot in the first round and haven't cooled off yet. You know, I think it's a really interesting debate because on the one hand, the top four seeds are technically playing better competition. Um, But is that competition going to be putting their best effort on the ice? That's yet to be determined. We don't know if these teams are going to be taking the seeding all that seriously. Um, I mean, you have teams like Boston that were 10 points ahead of everyone else in the standings at the end of the regular season. What kind of effort are they going to put forward? Are they going to be angry that they're not guaranteed the one seed and are they going to be going full send? Or is it going to be more of a, you know, we think we can really play with anybody in this league, so we're not going to put our best effort out there in the seeding games that aren't as important as you're right, playing for your life. So I think, Russo, you said mentality comes into a play a lot. I think that's true. But I also agree with Ryan that to kind of extra days off and not playing as physical hockey and as intense hockey right away could actually benefit the top four teams moving forward. Um, So with that and talking about these playoffs, let's start by jumping to the conference finals. It's really hard to predict anything right now because the NHL is not doing a firm bracket like we're used to seeing. They're kind of doing a reseeding at the end of each round where the top team will be playing the lowest seed remaining. Um, But just kind of pick teams you're confident in. Let's start in the Eastern Conference. Eastern Conference Finals predictions. Let's start with Ryan. What do you think? Eastern Conference Finals. So, yeah, I don't know. I disagree. I think at least for the East, it's a pretty easy prediction. I think it's going to be the Boston Bruins versus the Tampa Bay Lightnings. 
for the East. I think those are two very good teams. I mean, we've seen Tampa Bay have um, some success at least up until the conference finals in the past few years. And I mean, Boston's coming off of a season where they got to the conference finals. So I think at least if I had to make a guess who is going to be there in the East, those are the two teams I see getting there. I, uh, I disagree with the statement that the East is the easiest. I think it has the most good teams out of the two conferences. And as much as I don't want to go to the chalk here, I, I can't see the Bruins not making the conference finals because that top line is just disgusting of Martian, Pasternak, and Bergeron. But I, I think the Flyers are going to make – the, the conference finals because as someone who watched quite a bit of their games this year, they look, they, they are really, they have a lot of depth on the offensive end and Carter Hart is a really good young goalie. Um, and as much as it, it kills me to say that the Flyers are a really good team. And as much as I think the Bruins would probably beat them in that series, uh, I can see the Flyers making a good run. It, but of course, all depending on, you know, what sign of the bracket they are from the round round. In the Eastern Conference, I see almost every team possibly making a run towards the Stanley Cup final. And I'm being completely serious about that. The funny thing is, Montreal is the greatest team in the history of hockey, and that's the one team I don't think I can actually see reaching the final or maybe even – I mean, maybe getting out of the first round, but I don't, I don't really know. Every other team, I think, is dangerous or in some shape or form. However, it's so and, – and I agree with Brendan, by the way. I think West, the Eastern Conference is definitely the more dangerous conference. There are, a lot, there are a lot more veteran teams and a lot more dangerous teams. I could go with any combination of, of teams in the Eastern Conference final, but it's just so difficult to pick based on rest right now, based on a neutral site, and based on a 12-team Eastern Conference bracket. So I just say I go with what's safe. I say the Bruins are going back to the conference final. And you know, a lot of people say, you might say the Flyers. I think Washington is, all, is the most quietly stable out of the rest of them. The only team out of all the teams in the Eastern Conference that's won the Stanley Cup in the last two years. They gave Carolina a heck of a run last year. I'm going to say Bruins caps in the Eastern Conference final. I'm going to be the only person that does not pick two top four seeds. Um, I think that it's going to be a bit of a revenge tour this year. And I'm going to tell you my two teams. I'm going with the Lightning and the Penguins. Um, Although the Bruins are obviously really, really good, I think the Lightning and the Bruins are going to end up playing each other probably before the conference finals. Um, And I honestly picked the Lightning to come out of that series. Both the Penguins and the Lightning are teams that have been, for the past handful of seasons at the top of the Eastern conference. And last year they both got embarrassedly swept in the first round. Um, So I think it's going to be a bit of a revenge tour for both of those teams. I think Tampa Bay and Boston probably meet early and I think Tampa Bay wins it. I, Brendan, I do not have as much confidence in the flyers as you do. I'll tell you that much. That's fair. Um, I think Pittsburgh honestly deserves to be that four seed. I think the flyers just kind of got hot towards the end of the regular season that we saw. Um, I think the Penguins are a sneaky good five seed. Um, they're really dangerous. Obviously, Matt Murray's a great goalie. They still have Crosby, Malkin. So I have a lot of confidence in them. So I'm going to pick a different black and gold team. I'm going to go with the Penguins and the Lightning. Um, so head over to the Western Conference now. Again, really difficult to pick without knowing who's going to be where in the seating-wise. But Western Conference Finals, what do you think? Brendan, let's start with you. I think this one is definitely more straight up than the Eastern Conference. And I guess I don't want to go with the standard pick, but you got to – so I'm going to go with the Blues and the Avalanche because the Blues are, are hot on the heels of a, of a Stanley Cup. And the Avalanche are just an incredible offensive team, a really great offensive power. So um, I could see the Golden Knights also getting in there and possibly the Predators too, or the Oilers because of Drysaddle. But I really think um, – Drysaddle and McDavid – but I really think it's going to be the Blues and the Avalanche. Brian and I totally agree. Um, I honestly didn't think anyone else was going to pick this because I thought I was the only person that had super high confidence in the Avalanche. Um, 
given they haven't made super deep runs in the past couple of years. Um, but that team has a great offense. They're pretty young and they're just improving. I think the one area that I'm not super confident in is their goalie. Obviously they got a good tandem and obviously really only going to play your number one guy anyway. But I think the Western conference has better goalies like Mike, Mark Andre Fleury obviously is the number one guy out there. Um, so I just think the, the abs might struggle to keep pucks out of their own net, but I think their offense is just overpowering and the blues are the exact opposite. The blues are a great defensive team. Obviously they can score too, but their defense really stands out. So I didn't think anyone else was going to go with that pick. Um, but Brendan, I completely agree. I think that would be my series. And I don't see the, I think the blues are going to be the one and I don't see the avalanche falling to the four. So I think that can be an easy uh, conference final. Chris, what do you think? Well, you know what? I am once again, I'm going with one very safe team to, to reach the Western conference final. Uh, I'm going to say the blues go back to the conference final. It's once again, it's tough to pick in a 2014 tournament rest, all of that, yada, yada, yada. And the other one, I'm going to go with one team that's outside the top four. Because, first off, Dylan, I just want to point out, Mark andre Fleury is arguably the best goaltender in the Western Conference. Don't sleep on the rookie that won the Stanley Cup last year, uh, Jordan Bennington. So I'm going to take St. Louis going back to the conference final. And I'm actually going to take a team outside the top four. I am going to say the Edmonton Oilers finally get over the hump and get to the conference final. It was 2017 they should have gotten to the conference final and blew a three, nothing lead in game five in Anaheim. in like the last three minutes that probably would have helped them win game six at home, ice the series and go play Nashville, maybe make a run at the cup. But Edmonton after cooling off the last couple of years, I say is going to play the defending Stanley cup champion, St. Louis blues in the Western conference final. I think it's a really strong pick as well. Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I like the Edmonton pick. I didn't have them on my radar, but, I mean, if you're going to take any team outside of the top four, I think Edmonton is one of the best picks. Uh, so, yeah, for the West, Brendan uh, already talked about, uh, I think briefly mentioned one of mine, but in the West, I personally like uh, the Vegas Knights, Golden Knights, and the Dallas Stars. I think that – I think those are two very strong teams. Uh, we are going to get into finals predictions later, so – I'll elaborate a little more on what I like out of these teams um, and just the matchups. Um, all right. So Brendan has been very excited for this question. So we're going to talk about dark horses that could kind of sneak past these top four teams that you don't expect. Uh, let's start in the East because I think that's where Brendan's the most excited. Yes. Brendan, I'll throw it to you. Eastern Conference team uh, that you're expecting to kind of give some of these top four seeds a run for their money. Big surprise here. The New York Rangers. Oh. The New York Rangers have one of, one of the most underrated yet potent offenses in the league. Think of, think of uh, all their, their forwards. You have Artemi Panarin, uh, Mika Zibanejad. Ryan Strom is very underrated. Chris Kreider just signed a seven-year $100 million. No, not a $100 million deal, but uh, tens of million dollars. I don't it's remember exactly how much. It's a lot of money. Yes. Um, and they were one of three teams with seven players that got over 40 points. And don't even gloss over the fact that they have one of the best goalies to ever live, Henrik Lundqvist, who it might be ne nearing the tail end, but I said one of the, I said one of the. <laughs> I would just like to point out Marty Bodor is so much better. Can I just say something here? Own. Okay. To each their own. <laughs> Can I just say something here? Yeah. yeah Lundqvist okay. is probably like sixth. I agree Brodor's the best. It's like probably like Brodor, Wah, maybe like Joseph or Hashik or somebody, and then Lundqvist is probably like five or six. I would I'm agree with that. Saying that. But they have someone that could take one in maybe 15 years, Igor Shesterkin, trying to come up and, and come up big in the playoffs. And not to mention they went 4-0 against the Hurricanes, their first-round matchup so far in the regular season. So – I think the one team in the East that you really, really can't sleep on is the New York Rangers, especially considering they were the best team in hockey ever since January. Uh, all right. I, I think pretty much anybody except maybe Montreal could win the Stanley Cup coming out of the bottom eight in the Eastern Conference because Pittsburgh is going to have a healthy Crosby, even though I think this is maybe not one of the less deep rosters he's had in the last few years. Um, I have, let's see, the Islanders could be dangerous. Columbus lost Panarin, but they still they have great coaching in John Tortorella and still a lot of good young guys. 
Toronto maybe could do something. Florida is very underrated. There are a lot of good teams in the Eastern Conference in the bottom eight that could make a run. That being said, I'm going to say the New York Rangers. I yeah, well, sorry, fellas. <laughs> I, no, well, I'm I'm saying this because they got hot. They they look like the team the, the team of the future, perhaps, or a team of the future. They're built very well. They're healthy at the right time. Chris Kreider was hurt and was, according to John Davidson, the Rangers president, said recently that he was probably going to come back right as they had gone into quarantine. He was probably going to come back in time for the last eight or nine games or so. The Rangers have a great mix of youth and veteran leadership. They don't have a captain, but six years ago, they got to the Stanley Cup final without a captain. You know, you have a lot of good guys in the locker room, Mika Zibanejad, uh, Artemi Panarin is potentially the next captain of this team. Chris Kreider, I think, is another one. Mark Stahl, although not doing as much as an offensive star on the ice, is still one of the big guys. And Lundqvist is, of course, a major leader. And, you know, Brendan, you mentioned this with Lundqvist. Rangers have three solid goaltending options, and they're allowed to bring three. As, as a matter of fact, it's required. You're going to have to bring three goaltenders to Canada. So, you know, God forbid somebody gets COVID. They're going to have Georgiev, Shosturkin, and Lundqvist, three guys all of different ages, but all incredibly talented. And actually, just one thing to point out, the Rangers actually have more regulation wins than any other team in the bottom eight in uh, in the Eastern Conference. So for the Eastern Conference, I, I'll say the Rangers are the dark horse, though there and are as, a lot of as weak as weak as their defense comes off to be, the individual pieces seem to be overall greater than the sum if that makes any sense, Tony D'Angelo, Adam Fox for call the trophy. Uh, and, um, and uh, uh, Jacob Truba as well, who they just got for the Winnipeg Jets this past season, although he underperformed, he's still always a threat out there. Uh, they, they have pieces that once they meld really well, gets them really good wins. And uh, I think I, I, they started to meld really well as the season came to a close. So I can see them bringing that over into into uh into the bubble ryan i'm done with the rangers talk tell me somebody else (laughs) good point uh well the rangers talk is gonna for a little little bit i am happy they made this tournament that's all i'll kind of say if it was the devils in this situation like being what were they three games out or something and the devils were literally one point away because it came down to point percentage if the devils had one more point the entire season they would have replaced montreal Wow. Okay. Well, I was talking about the Rangers, like how close they were. Oh, uh, the they... Rangers were two points out as of the season's conclusion. Okay. If they had not gotten in, like I, I pictured that, like if that was the Devils, I would have been heartbroken. So, right. yes, good that the Rangers got in. All right, we're done with Rangers talk finally. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris mentioned uh, my team. Um, I do think the Rangers have a good shot. All that stuff. They were getting hot, and there's some good pieces there, but. I really like the Florida Panthers to kind of be a dark horse. I think you have fantastic goaltending there. You have a three-time cup winner head coach. That's a big factor. Two of the greatest young players that we have in the league right now. They were kind of just, uh, I don't know if mediocre is the right word, but they were more like just kind of an average team. But I think coming into this little round ramen, coming into this playoff format, they're going to be one of the hungriest teams. Yeah, uh, I believe they play the Islanders first round, which is a tough matchup. Um, mm-hmm. but that'll be a good series to watch. My, I think the five seeds in both conferences, in this one, Pittsburgh, they're incredibly dangerous. Um, and obviously they're the top of the bottom eight for a reason. And I think that's one team to watch to make a really deep run. I honestly, I don't think the Rangers are going to go past the first round, quite honestly. I think Carolina, although you guys have a 4-0 record against them this year, whatever, Last year, Carolina really surprised me with what they had, and I'm not going to underestimate them again because I did last year, and they made a pretty deep run, and I was very impressed. Um, But I think the highest seed that could really – or sorry, the lowest seed that could really upset maybe a higher seed is the Maple Leafs at eight. Um, They are are incredibly impressive. And you were talking about top lines. They have quite the top line, led led by Austin Matthews. I just I think the Maple Leafs, although I'm not too keen on them, I think that they are a great team that can make a really deep run. Um, depending on how the seeding shakes up, we'll see. But 
I think they're going to get past Columbus, and they are a really, really good team with a lot of offensive firepower. If I can, oh, um, go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, if, if I can just point out, first off, it's not you guys. Uh, uh, Brendan and I are, are not the Rangers, although I think we do a decent job of running them. Uh, I – Caroline, you know what the thing is? You hear from people, and I, I think about this, it's so true that the Rangers being 4-0 and against Carolina is a little bit of a curse for them because, you know, you talk about teams that, like you talk about it's so tough in the NFL to beat a team three times in a year. Right. And it, it's so weird that, you know, sweep a team in the regular season not in the playoff. That's so big about that. That's what's so tough about that. And another thing actually going off the Maple Leafs, it's funny, a lot of people don't uh, realize it, but the Maple Leafs, if they don't, not saying they will, not saying they won't, if they don't win the Stanley Cup this year, they actually tie the Rangers from 1940 to 94 for the longest Stanley Cup draft. Hmm. It, not in terms of – Please take that away from us. <laughs> because they'll have, uh, they'll have the lockout year uh, in addition to it. But, but uh, in terms of actual years, it'll be, it'll be tied with Rangers for wow. 54 years. That is quite the drought. Um, and I hope the Rangers don't break theirs. No offense. But let's move over to the Western Conference. Uh, same question. Who do you think is going to be a good sleeper team? One of the low seeds that you think can surprise some people? Uh, I'm going to go with the Winnipeg Jets. I think they have really talented roster, considering they have Line A, Blake Wheeler, Connor Hellebuck. Uh, Mark, Mark, Shai, I never know how to say his name. Shai Shai yeah, yeah, and then Cody Eakin. Uh, I think they have a really talented roster, a good goaltender, and I think they have the pieces to to at least get to the next round and put up a fight with the top four seed. Well, like the Eastern Conference, and I, I'd like to point out, Brendan and I did not correlate these. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm going with the Winnipeg Jets, actually. Winnipeg is – one of the few really experienced teams in the bottom eight of the Western Conference. And, of course, you have the, the Blackhawks, but the thing is Blackhawks have a lot of their depth players from when they won the Stanley Cup that are on different teams now. You know, they have that nucleus, but they're still a 12, and they, they barely snuck in. Winnipeg is the only Western Conference team in the qualifying round to have reached the conference final within the last five years and still have a lot of its roster intact. They had a golden opportunity – against the St. Louis Blues last year. They, get, they lost the first two games at home, then won two games in St. Louis, lost a couple of, of uh, really hard-fought games at the very end against the Blues at home and, and barely lost in the first round. A couple of years ago, they got to the conference final for the first time in their history, at least since they – in the second iteration of the Winnipeg Jets. And, you, you know, they don't have home ice, but to point out, they're playing in their home country. They're going to be playing in Edmonton, which is one province over in Alberta. Uh, so I, I think Winnipeg is, is very good. Connor Halbuck is underrated. You have a dangerous sniper in Patrick Line. Uh, once again, a, a solid, solid veteran defenseman, in Dustin Bufflin. Uh, Mark Shifley. And um, actually, going back to that Ranger thing, you mentioned uh, Jacob Truba. The Jets have, an, I think, an underrated uh, young defenseman, not one of their top guys, but an underrated young defenseman that came in that Truba trade for, from the Rangers, and that's Neil Piak, who I think is a very underrated guy who brings a lot of heart to that team. So I, I, I'm going to say Winnipeg is the dark horse in the bottom eight in the West. Uh, much like how you, uh, I didn't go Rangers, I am not going Jets. This is a very, very long shot, and I am aware of that. I don't think, like, I don't know what their potential is, but there is something telling me that the Blackhawks can really do something in this tournament. I think you can never count them out as a team. I think that they have a lot of talent on that team that could really see success when it comes to the playoffs. You know, I think if they didn't have such a tough matchup in that first round, uh, I think they're playing the Oilers. I would completely agree with you. But I think the five seeds, like I've said several times, the five seeds are incredible. Um, and I think the Oilers are going to take that series. Although I think the Blackhawks are going to give them a run for their money. Um, I think the Oilers could go really far. Obviously, five seed again, kind of a lame pick. Um, you know, Winnipeg, they enticed me a little bit. I was kind of tempted to go there, but it seems they always kind of put a really good effort into a series and then kind of lose in six or seven, um, especially when they're playing higher seeds. I think one team with experience that still has somewhat of their nucleus left is Nashville. 
uh, from when they were in it a couple of years ago. Um, so maybe they could make a run, but I think to me, the West is more top heavy um, than the East. I think the East is more well-rounded and the West, I really have more confidence in the top four seeds. Um, so I want a quick Stanley cup final prediction. Who's in it and how many games Chris Russo. Well, I'm going to say this one more time and it's a cliche now, but the fact that it's impossible to predict right. 2014 <laughs> tournaments, rest, yada, 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 George Costanza, whatever. I think it's going to be a rematch. I'm going to say Bruins blues once again, uh, because two teams who are so dominant on both at both ends of the ice, two of the best defensive teams of, of last year of the last decade, really two unbelievable goaltenders in Jordan Bennington and Tuka Rask. I'm going to say it goes seven. Am I picking the winner? Yes. I, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say blues win again in seven games. I'm going with St. Louis. Ryan, what do you think? Wow. That is a, uh, that's an interesting one. We're starting to have a uh, Cavs golden state situation, <laughs> but uh, um, so for my matchups, I'll go back to my conference finals. I had Boston versus Tampa, you know, that series, if it were to happen, absolute battle of the goaltenders that would be a really tough series but I think uh Boston advances then we have Tampa um versus Vegas out uh, oh no I'm sorry we have uh Vegas versus Dallas in the west oh that was the thing I was gonna say so if Tampa doesn't go to the Stanley Cup this year kind of bold prediction I think some major changes are coming I'll put that out there that I think major changes are coming to Tampa if they fall short again for the West, though, uh, that would be what I predicted, Vegas versus Dallas. I think for the second time in three seasons, we're going to see Vegas in the Stanley Cup Finals. So in my situation, you have Boston versus Vegas, and I'm going to go Bruins here. Um, Vegas has a lot of enticing things. I think they have a better goaltender, maybe a bit, a bit of a better defense, but Boston has so many good lines. They're very crafty. Um, it would be a tough series, but I do like Boston. I, I don't ever like picking games. I don't know, uh, five or six for Boston. So, I would go Bruins Avalanche. Uh, I know the Avalanche isn't the popular pick, but I, I really like their offense. And it's, it's very hard. No, when, when, when a defending champion makes it all the way to the conference final, there's a lot of pressure to keep it going. And I don't think people take that into account enough, the pressure to, to try and repeat. Uh, I mean, of course, the Blues could come out on top so easily. But I, I, I like the Avalanche's chances, uh, but not in the cup against the Bruins. I'd say Bruins in six in that matchup. I'm very proud of myself that I usually don't pick underdogs, but I'm going to have – the one pick that's not a top four seed. I'm going to pick the Penguins out of the East. Um, I think this is going to be Crosby's last real shot at the cup and last hurrah um, before they kind of go down a slope. Um, so I'm going to say Penguins, and I agree with Brennan. I think the Avalanche are going to come out of that West. It's going to be tightly contested, I think, between Avs, Blues, but I have a little more faith in the Avalanche. Um, I think the Avs are actually going to win it this year. I have the Avs probably in six games against the Penguins. That's my pick. I really like Colorado. Um, pretty confident in them to at least make the conference finals, and but I think they're going to be my Stanley Cup winner. We're going to take a hard underdog like Sidney Crosby and the Pittsburgh Penguins. <laughs> I mean, given where they this are, year. This no, year, you're right. This year, I, I just throw. I, I just had to point it out. And his age. I mean, he's get, he's definitely getting up there, as is a lot of the core of that team. Um, but you can never count them out, especially with such a good young goalie, Matt Murray. Huh. They're they're going to be a hard out no matter what. Um, but taking a turn, we're going to talk about the NHL and its kind of popularity and its fandom struggle, because honestly, it is the least popular of the four major sports here in America. Um, and it is also a league that is not very diverse. It is estimated there's only about 5% minority players in the National Hockey League. So following the death of George Floyd, a lot of these minority players, as well as others, spoke out about racial injustice, racial inequality, and how it affects the league. Um, I will toot the Rangers horn for a quick second here. The Rangers prospect, DeAndre Miller, an African-American hockey player, ha was very outspoken about this. And I thought the most open, which is incredibly impressive for a young player, I thought he addressed it better than anyone else, kind of how his race affected him growing up in the sport and in locker rooms. Do you think there are more steps this league can be taking to help diversify and just 
its locker rooms as well as its coaching staffs and its front offices? Yeah, I'll kind of start with this one. Um, you're right about the George Floyd situation. Um, obviously very unfortunate, but this has not been the first case of it. I wish it was the last, but it's a sad truth in America that this stuff is going on and it's time for a change. And, you know, I can't predict the future, but it seems with um, this George Floyd incident, that stuff is starting to be taken a little more seriously. Stuff we're seeing bigger, like bigger things from, uh, you know, real world changes that I'm pretty happy about. Um, I do have this time, I wanna plug our executive producer, um, Christian Gardner did do a fantastic video with the with Seton Hall's BSU, the Black Student Unit, uh, Black Student Union, excuse me. Um, and you know, that's a video that is something bigger than all of us. It's bigger than sports right now. Um, so yeah, for the NHL, um, I don't know really what locker room wise they could do. Um, the biggest thing, the biggest two things I'll say is, you know. I hope that no organization would not take a player, would not take a staff member because the color of his skin. And that goes for coaching staff, front office, as I said. I hope they would I hope that stuff wouldn't happen because that doesn't belong in the NHL. Now, my biggest idea is investing in, I would like the league or maybe teams or maybe players to invest in putting up hockey rinks in areas with a high population of people of color. Um, I'll look at what the Toronto Raptors did. Um, I'll compare that to, I know basketball and a hockey rink is way different, but I kind of liked what the Toronto Raptors did and it paid off. So you have the challenge of, you know, you put a basketball, you put a basketball team in the heart of hockey country and, you know, it was rough for the Toronto in the beginning, but you started getting stars like uh, Vince Carter, Tracy McGrady. And, you know, just last year, 2019, they had, they won the championship. Toronto, Toronto Raptors won the championship. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't tell a difference, like the Raptors fans celebrating versus like if LA had won something or something. So that's what I think the NHL should do personally is invest in putting up hockey rinks in areas with, people of, you know, people of color that have a high population of people with color. I would uh, agree with that. I think hockey, not, not the NHL, but hockey as a whole, as a sport, has a culture problem. As in, it costs so much money, it's just to get involved. It is so not accessible to less fortunate individuals. Um, so if they want to help diversify the sport, um, that could be a great first step is, you know, putting hockey rinks in less fortunate areas. And I also want to point out, uh, an article for the Players Tribune by, uh, former NHLer Akeem Alou called Hockey is Not for Everyone. And it's about the culture problems within NHL and, um, semi-pro um lock hockey locker rooms and a lot of it is about uh, a lack of accountability between because of the lack of diversity uh when it comes to racism and bigotry there's no accountability and there needs to be a greater responsibility within the league as a whole to to hold their counterparts to that so before you have coaches and executives in the National Hockey League. You need to have players. You need to have guys who are experienced in order to get to those positions beyond a playing career. Now, the National Hockey League has done a good job as, of moving into the southern United States, and, uh, creating big fan bases in Nashville, Tampa Bay, uh, Dallas. Um, Austin Matthews was is from Arizona, and that's a place where you wouldn't expect – to have uh, hockey players, big hockey players come. And Austin Matthews, obviously, you know, he's not African-American, but there are guys who have th – this is also an example, although Seth Jones is one guy who, who has come from the Dallas area uh, into the National Hockey League. There have only been, however, a handful of African-American players. And obviously African-Americans don't make up minorities as a whole, but 
that's the major that's the thing that's the majority of minority players that we've seen are African American. So you know you had a, also a couple of um, Asian Pacific Islander players. You had um, I remember Richie Park and Kyle Okposo from the Islanders. There haven't been a lot of non Caucasian players in the National Hockey League. Now there have been pioneers, Willie O'Ree, of course, um, the first African-American player in the history of the National Hockey League. And there have been big stars, P.K. Subban probably being the biggest, uh, or Grant Fuhrer as well, uh, from the Edmonton Oilers. But, you know, it's been so tough. So the league really needs to build from the ground up. They need to uh, – it's easier to diversify coaching staffs if there is diversity in players first. So they have to do this by developing youth hockey more – in, you know, we know there are, there's a significant African-American population in the inner cities, not to generalize anything here, but statistics have shown that, you know, the African-American population is bigger in the inner cities. And Brendan mentioned that it's kind of tough. It's very tough to afford a lot of things. A lot of hockey players come from the suburbs. You look in Canada, it's not a very, you know, it's not a very, a lot of parts of Canada are not urban. Uh, so a lot of these guys are coming from, you know, little towns in Ontario and, uh, they're going to have to build up players in the inner cities. They're, they're trying to do that. A lot of teams have tried to do that. Um, and then they're going to have to keep developing in the, in the Southern U S youth hockey. But the other thing is the league and individual and individual teams must be more vigilant in hiring and evaluating coaches so as to prevent incidents like those uh, Brendan mentioned with Akima Lou, that was, I believe that was Bill Peters who was fired for the things that he said. And Mike Babcock was another one. And that's how you know how high up these things go. Because Mike Babcock was one of the finest coaches, not, not to say what he did as a person was right, but that shows that, you know, even some of the better coaches have, have uh, let uh, these disgusting things, you know, permeate their locker rooms and have caused these things to permeate their locker rooms. So if the league can build from the ground up, hopefully we can have a future where there are more minority players, executives, coaches, referees, everybody. And uh, hopefully that, that, that will make some sort of difference in the National Hockey League. Yeah, I think the NHL's league itself has tried to at least better represent the diversity that it does have. Um, you know, earlier this season, back when we had a season, um, they had like a mobile bus touring stadiums called the Black Hockey History Tour to kind of highlight African Americans in the sport. Um, PK Subban, a minority player, has basically become the face of the NHL Instagram, um, especially during quarantine. He was on there all the time. He hosted like a little short series they did. Um, but I think even when the George Floyd situation was at its peak, and obviously it's still incredibly tense and we haven't really come to a conclusion of any sort of, set of terms of satisfac satisfactory yet. Um, but you saw these minority players speaking about racial injustice, but they didn't talk about it in the NHL and in their lives as hockey. And that's why I was so impressed with Keandre Miller who did do that. And he really opened up about how his race affected him growing up in hockey. And I think that's something, I think that's a conversation that's really important to have moving forward because it needs to better be understood that this is a real problem. Although there are some minority players in the NHL, a lot of these guys have faced adversity reg regarding their race. Um, one of the wild defensemen, JT Brown, mentioned wearing pregame shirts, kind of like the NBA, WNBA, a lot of these leagues are doing. I think that would be a good step to see in the bubble. Um, so we'll have to see. But I think the NHL this year, even before things got heightened, were putting in an effort. Um, so hopefully moving forward, there will be a continued effort to diversify this league because a lot of these players make great impacts. And I think there's a lot of people that want to play this sport that aren't being reached. I could just say warning before we move on. If anyone didn't know, Charles has you know, been so outspoken because he's African-American and affects him. Every other African-American affects all of us uh, to some extent. Uh, but he was, uh, I can't remember exactly when this was, but this was sometime earlier during the quarantine that he was taking part in a 
sort of a meet and greet, a virtual meet and greet with Rangers fans. He, he's, you know, one of the guys who's the future of the franchise. And someone, a quote unquote troll, I guess, um, made racist comments over this uh, just comments section, I suppose. And I, th- I think the Rangers shut this thing down. And Keandre Miller could not have hand- – and, um, well, the Rangers organization as well uh, – could not have handled this um, much better. You could not have handled it with much more uh, grace through all this you know, disgusting hate speech. Uh, so he's just a guy I wanted to single out and uh, for, for his activism. Yeah, it definitely is a problem. And I think the teams as well as the league is trying to address it. Um, especially as of this season and some of the effort they put forward. So it's good to see. But moving forward kind of into another area where the NH- just continuing to talk about the NHL's popularity, popularity struggle, I think they had this slow agreement to finally announce their restart. They finally r- reached their agreement like in early July, I believe it was July 6th, which was several weeks after the disgruntled Major League Baseball discussions and their agreement was reached. Um, and I thought hockey had a real opportunity to be the first league to come to an agreement and get fans excited of, oh, this sport's going to be back. And if they were the first sport to be back, I think that could have been huge for the fandom of the sport. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Facilities were open, but there was no firm schedule, no firm agreement of when play was going to start. So kind of just branching off that, what do you guys think this did for the league? Do you think it's going to be in big impact that – they're the last sport and they're not really generating that fandom? Um, I think it most certainly was a missed opportunity um, to make a comeback, be one of the first sports back, and have those extra sports fans that originally wouldn't have been watching them, you know, join in, I guess. Um, I think it could affect it a little bit, the fact that they're the last rather than, say, the second or third, or rather than the second, because there are only three, Um, because all the other fans, say NBA and NHL fans, someone that likes both sports, could possibly be watching NBA rather than NHL. Um, It was just overall a missed opportunity. I don't think it will drastically affect um, viewership and fandom, but it, it it was a massive missed opportunity to be the first sport back. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about uh, that both of you guys said about the potential. Um, I don't feel like I need to really elaborate on that more, but as far as like fans now and stuff, I don't think it'll have a big, uh, I don't think it'll have a big impact. Like I think they're still hopefully going to get the same numbers that they were getting. Um, but I think a lot of people, a lot of fans, I mean, are just really happy to have the NHL back. So the big thing is, and we've seen this with baseball, as long as the players and staff are staying safe and healthy, and that's the number one like thing right now, as like for them to stay safe, as long as that continues, then I'm fans and me included should be very excited for the NHL to be starting back up. You know, looking at hockey, I don't think they're going to be hurt by starting two weeks after uh, the, or, or reaching an agreement two weeks after the MLB did and starting about a week after they did. It's not going to hurt them, but they, I think Dylan, you're right. They missed an opportunity. Because the National Hockey League, or hockey in general, I think is such an underrated sport. I love baseball, football, basketball, especially college. I would argue hockey is the most exciting sport. But the thing is, hockey in the United States is almost like the show community. It's so great. It's so good to watch. And it's fantastic. But the problem is, it's only so beloved by certain pockets of people in the United States. And it has the chance to be so much bigger. But at this point, you know, some people are screwing it up. So the NHL missed an opportunity. Um, but the good news is those groups, that cult group, that the group of rabid fans in the United States, they're so hungry for live sports. Honestly, I didn't think there was going to be a Stanley Cup playoffs this year. 
because they had canceled every other hockey league in the world, every league in the world, Finland, Sweden, Russia, uh, the OHL, the CHL, the AHL here in, in, in the United States and Canada, everybody except the NHL had canceled their games for the year. So I think hockey fans are so hungry for live hockey and live sports, and the idea that we will get to watch Stanley Cup playoff hockey this summer is so fantastic. It won't. It, it will not hurt them. That's the good news. Yeah, I think that was a great clarification. It's not going to hurt because you're not going to lose fans to the other sports. But I think not being earlier to this is definitely going to not attract more fans. And I think that was a really big opportunity. Um, another opportunity, obviously, this still again struggling with fandom. This isn't the NHL's fault necessarily, um, but I think. We talked about how it's such a more popular sport in Canada than here in America. There was a really strong suspicion that Vegas was going to be the West hub city. Um, That was kind of before the outbreak really got bad in Nevada. And I think that's going to have an impact as well. I just think that because of the excitement of the sport in Canada compared to the U S I think being in America, even though no fans can attend these games, having this large group of players in an American city, I think would have drummed up more excitement in this country, um, which I think is just going to be lacking now. Obviously not the league's fault because kind of how things progressed, but I think that would have been a good opportunity for the league. The NHL opening up a little late, it doesn't necessarily help, but I don't think it really hurts because the fact is nobody would have been able to go to playoff games if they were in the U.S. anyway. So, right. I, I, so it won't, I don't think it's going to have a negative impact either in that sense. Honestly, I think so long as Americans will be able to watch the playoffs on TV and hear Doc Emmerich's golden voice, all mm-hmm. will be fine. Very good point and love the praise for uh, the good doctor. Um, I would really hope not that it wouldn't affect uh, American NHL fans. I mean, the NHL had to make a decision either to put this in – the USA or Canada. I mean, yeah, we talked about it earlier in the show, I believe, about you can't go back and forth with, like, the logistics of that would be borderline impossible. But I am a little surprised, actually, they put it in Canada um, because the NHL headquarters are in New York City. But one of the big reasons I think that it was put in Canada is they have handled this virus flat out better than this country. I mean, most countries have, if not all countries, have handled it better than we have. But I think that's personally a big factor that Canada has taken this a little more serious and haven't seen the numbers that we have. Yeah, I'd agree with the Chris's sentiment that I don't think this really has any impact on fans. I think fans will just be happy to have it back. I know I am. I really don't care that it's somewhere else. Unless you're that you're that um, patriotic that if it's not in America you're not going to watch it, um, which I don't think many people are. If you're a hockey fan, um, I uh, I don't think it'll have a major impact on the fandom. I think, Chris, the point you made about, or maybe it was Ryan, about kind of two different countries. I hadn't really thought that was an issue, um, but now that you point that out, obviously it is. Because I had been hearing early on in this process that it was going to be Toronto and Vegas, that those were the two favorites. Um, And that might have been true, but then I guess at some point they had to pick a country, so you're not traveling back and forth. Um, I just think if it was in America, not again, it's not going to impact hockey fans, but I think if you have this large hub of amazing athletes, whether they're for a sport that you're really interested in or not, especially if it was in Vegas, that might stir up. Obviously, Vegas is kind of because they're a newer franchise, people like that sport now anyway. But I think just having them in America might have just outreached a little bit to non-hockey fans. Um, That was my thought there. I don't think people are not going to watch because it's in Canada. I just think it could have reached a broader audience of Americans where the sport lacks in popularity if they knew, okay, this is going on pretty close to me, opposed to 500 plus miles away up in Canada. That was my thought process there. Um, Uh, Don't first off, it was Ryan. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, First off, it was uh, Ryan's point, but I just wanted to, uh, to say that I got a chance a couple of months ago to interview a great ho- ho- uh, Hall of Fame hockey writer from New Jersey uh, named Michael Farber, who's living up in Montreal. And uh, there are uh, pockets of Canada that Montreal was hit very hard. And the point is, we were met talking about um, 
where the NHL was probably going to start if they came back. And he told me it was, they were leaning towards Toronto and Columbus. Um, but yeah, but the, the fact is it's so hard uh, to do that in Canada and the U S and the other thing is very recently, right before we recorded this, uh, it, I saw that commissioner Bettman and, uh, and, uh, and Bill Daly, the deputy commissioner of the league, will not be on hand in Toronto or Edmonton for the, the first few games because they're going to have, they'd have to do, there's no exception. Even for the commissioner of the NHL, they'd have to go undergo the 14 day quarantine. So think about that. Could you ever imagine a commissioner not being able to go and see a restart of his or her sport because uh, he or she can't cross international borders? Uh, j- that's just what this has come to. It's unbelievable to think. Yeah, I think because Toronto, originally it seemed like they were going to be able to cross international borders. I think I was applying the same logic to hockey, but obviously I was talking about the Blue Jays. Um, but obviously seeing how that situation played out, now it's unreasonable to think that hockey would be any different. So I agree that it's kind of better to pick one country. I just thought that maybe being in America, they would outreach a little bit better to f- people that aren't typically fans. Um Switching gears, a couple questions for you guys. So I want to know, did the draft lottery bother you like it bothered me? Because to me, the fact that the draft lottery, a qualifying team that's in the qualifying round starting on August 1st, one of those teams is going to be the number one overall pick. So to me, it kind of seems like these qualifying playoff teams were involved in the draft lottery, and that kind of irked me, especially since my team was in it. I think that makes it a little bit different. Um, but what did you guys think? Uh, considering my team is in the qualifying round, I think it's perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I, 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 I totally understand if um, there's any, I guess, skepticism towards that. Um, I, I don't like how a qualifying team, from, from a hockey fan point of view rather than a Rangers fan point of view, I, 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 don't, I would, would agree with the sentiment that it is kind of ridiculous that a qualifying team could possibly get the number one overall pick unless the Rangers get it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do – it left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth as, a, as an objective viewer of the draft lottery. Yeah, the biggest thing for me was, like, the percentages and stuff too, that, yeah, it's very possible. I mean – I can't think of yet. Yeah, I don't think that's ever been done with like since lottery stuff that you could potentially, I know it's a very long shot. You could potentially have a team win the Stanley cup finals and get a first pick. I mean, that's crazy for me, but I think this is a bigger issue of um, kind of the playoff like points and stuff. Now, there's never going to be a perfect system where everybody is happy. I'm pretty okay with how they did the seating and stuff, but in some instances, it doesn't kind of work. Uh, and, and in some instances, it does. For example, in the Metro, uh, the Devils, nine points back. No way should have went to the qualifying thing. Or, but when you look at a division like the Atlantic, Buffalo, the Sabres, were only three points behind and, again, I don't know how the NHL would have changed that, um, but it's just interesting to look at the kind of how close some teams were um, and, yeah, how kind of strange these play, the, uh, the lotteries, uh, lottery odds are for teams who are going to continue to play hockey. You know, I thought, first off, considering – the 2020-2021 the 2020, 20, the 2020, season is going to start later anyway. It's probably going to start in – oh, I, oh, I'm sorry. It's been confirmed. Actually, it's January 1st, I believe. I would have waited until after the qualifying round to actually do the draft lottery because it doesn't make a difference for the, for the teams that are already out. And then at that point, you know, the other eight teams would have been gone, at which point it would have been the same as a regular draft – as a regular lottery. So, because it's the, well, now it's the, then it would be the 15 teams that were out of the playoffs. All right. So, but since it takes five rounds to win the Stanley Cup as a qualifier, and I'm not going to suggest that anybody will, some teams could actually consider tanking now in order to get the number one pick, thinking, 
you know what, we don't want to play five rounds or play three or four rounds, just get knocked out and waste the opportunity of a number one pick. So some teams could potentially, although I, I'm not saying they will, could consider tanking. There's an eight to one, there's an eight to one chance of getting the number one pick as opposed to 24 teams, a 24 to one chance of winning the Stanley cup. Right. Eight teams, the eight qualifying teams that would get knocked out in the first round that have a, a chance at the number one pick, 24 teams going for the Stanley Cup. And also, the fact that the league is conducting two lotteries proves not only the rarity of the situation, but it may also suggest the league just conducted the first one before the playoffs in order to retain fan attention. Because, you know, we talk about uh, how the league did take longer to draft an agreement and finally get play ready. So the, the first draft lottery might have just been a ploy and, and just, to, to, just to get the league some airtime, really. Although I do want to point out at the end here, it's remarkable, though, that the Red Wings were the only team to finish with a, a winning percentage under 400, not only under 400, but a 275 winning percentage, and they finished with the third pick. Yeah. When nobody, maybe Ottawa, but nobody else was close to them in terms of, frankly, mediocrity this year, and they end up with the number three pick. I just do think, because it's unprecedented circumstances that, you know, they're changing everything. Why wouldn't they just change the lottery? I just think it's a little dumb that they kept it, like, the same and gave an opportunity to a team that's in the playoffs a chance at the number one pick. Right. I think the airtime point, Chris, is really important. I think they probably did want to be on TV because, obviously, there's not a lot going on. So give fans of just sports in general something to watch. Um, but I think that if they had done it after this first qualifying round, I think it would have sat better with people that even though these people, these teams were technically like in contention for the playoffs. Okay. Now they're out of it. Now you can do the draft lottery without thinking that like a playoff team or a playoff caliber team is getting the chance of the number one overall pick. But Ryan, you talked about percentages. I think they had like, a 25% chance that a qualifying team was going to get the number one overall pick. Um, but we'll see how the second lottery goes. We'll see who ends up getting it. Uh, I think it's going to be somewhere between that qualifying and first round of playoffs. So we'll see. One last thing I wanted to get you guys to talk about. The Seattle Kraken was released as the 32nd team in the NHL on July 23rd. Um, big day of announcing their team name, their logo, colors, all this. Uh, it was very exciting to watch. Again, kind of something that the NHL was able to at least produce as an excitement grabber. Um, what did you think of the name? Uh, is there anything else you thought would have been better? Brendan, I'll start with you. I think it's exciting. I, I really like Kraken is something that I have never like considered. I, I had a feeling they'd do something, you know, ocean, water, marine, right. life, whatever. But the Kraken is is creative. I remember. Well, I remember at first I was really skeptical about the Golden Knights because I was like, why wouldn't they do aces or spades or something like that? But it, it grew on me, and this this name didn't have to grow on me for me to really like it. And I, I really like their color scheme. I like the red accent on their jerseys. I think it's a nice touch. And I just like the, the, blue, and, the blue and teal kind of vibe of, of, of their colors. I, I, I really like the, um, the new team. And I think they might be my number two team now. <laughs> so there is a lot to love that Brendan already mentioned about this team. Uh, two big things I do want to talk about that uh, you mentioned was the fact that this team is coming to Seattle. That is such a passionate city when it comes to sports. Um, I feel like the Northwest in general, really, because, you know, they're not like, there's not a ton of teams up there. So they just love their teams uh, when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to Seattle and that general area. The other thing that I absolutely love about this team is the design of their jerseys and how much detail was put into the team design. I mean, when you look at a, when you look at the logo, the S for Seattle, you can see like a Kraken tentacle in there, like the red eye. And then for like uh, on the sides, the uh, anchor, it's the Seattle Sea Needle. I mean, 
that is such a cool, cool design. Credits to the uh, graphic design team for that one. Um, I I love the uh, I love the idea of uh, a Seattle hockey team, and I love the design. You know what's something that I haven't seen anyone talk about is that bringing a Seattle hockey team to Seattle. Um, it opens up opportunities for more than just hockey, because if you have an arena in Seattle, why not bring the SuperSonics back? Absolutely. Why not bring an NBA team back to Seattle, where, where they haven't had one in twenty years? I, I think I think it's it's a really great opportunity not only for the NHL but just for all of Seattle. Okay. Before I get into this, uh, first off, I'd just like to point out I I've been very open at, at saying the 32nd NHL team should be the Quebec Nordiques because that's a, that's a city that's been really, that deserves an NHL franchise. And, you know, it's been, I've said, you know, Quebec needs, Quebec city needs an NHL team. Montreal needs a baseball team, especially after watching, you know, the team that left them win the world series last year and Seattle needs a basketball team. So that's one thing, which I thought it would have been a great dig if they make, named this team, the Seattle supersonics. Uh, yeah. I, and then on top of that, I was kind of questioning why they put a team in Seattle because it's a great fan base. Brendan mentioned that. Seahawks have won a Super Bowl. Hey, I mentioned that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ryan mentioned that. Uh, the Seahawks have won a Super Bowl. Uh, the the Mariners went crazy with, you know, remember the, the Ken Griffey, that team that saved baseball in Seattle in 95. And the Supersonics, a lot of people don't realize, won an NBA championship before leaving Seattle. It was before Gary Payton. They won in the late 70s. Um, Jackson and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I also thought, you know, why why would they put a team in Seattle when you have Vancouver right there and you have the Canucks? That being said, I I love the name, and the the design is absolutely beautiful. That sea blue, uh, and the logo is lovely. The jersey is excellent. It reminds me a little bit of the of the Mariners and the Seahawks uniforms. And the funny thing is, when I saw not the the really cool uh, crack in the S logo, but the the logo where it says Seattle crack and it looked the Seattle looked very reminiscent of the font for Seattle for the Seahawks. So I I really like um, whoever designed this. Uh, much kudos to that person, and it should be really exciting uh, to to get a team up there. Not to mention even out the league and put sixteen teams in each conference. You guys have all hit on it. The detail orientation of everything that came out of that announcement was impeccable. Um, I think, obviously, now we're talking about teams that are Native American-based and getting away from that. I thought the Totems would have been a cool name. And I think if anywhere was to pay proper homage to the Native American culture, it would have been Seattle, especially seeing how much effort they put into their arena and its climate awareness. Um, if you don't know about that, look at – the NHL Seattle Instagram page has a great like three minute video about everything they're going to do to try and make this arena as climate friendly and like carbon zero neutral as possible. Um, so I think this city would have been, if any, the best to actually lift up a native American culture opposed to kind of degrading it through their sports and the nicknames and all that. Um, but I get why they strayed away from that, especially with everything going on right now. Um, I also really like, the like emerald green color scheme, which I think would have been a also good option. But I think like you guys said, the color scheme's great. The red accent, like Brendan mentioned, really adds a nice, like just really rounds it out. And the detail in the logos, all three that you guys talked about are incredible. Um, hopefully we can show you the graphic, pop that up on the screen. That'd be awesome. I hope you guys see that. If not, look it up. The Seattle Kraken jerseys are gorgeous. Um, and like Brendan said, he, they might be my new second team because I had an affinity for the Golden Knights when they came out. And now that this team in Seattle is coming out, they might have me as a fan. Um, ooh, last question I added. This is a surprise for all of you. You're not going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, Blackhawks name change, yes or no? Chris, what do you think? Uh, for the name change, I don't think that's necessary because, um, look, obviously, you know, Washington needed to change their name. Cleveland's going to need to change their name. I would understand why the Blackhawks would change their logo. Um, although, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying this as a, as a – a fan of the design. I've always loved the Jersey, but I definitely would understand why they would change their logo. However, uh, the Blackhawks have the, the Blackhawks are, are, there is no Blackhawk tribe. However, the Blackhawks are named after a native American named Blackhawk uh, who uh, stood up to 
I can't remember the whole story exactly, but I, I did do some research on it. Um, it is named after an actual Native American named Black Hawk. Uh, so I don't think they need to change the name, but the logo, I definitely understand. I definitely understand why they would change that. Ryan, do you think it's going to stay or go? Well, that's a, a question of, do I think it's going to stay or go? I have no idea. Uh, what I would hope would be that definitely the logo, honestly, I would like to see a whole rebrand. I want to see uh, the name changed. I think for the Chicago area, you can do so much stuff with that. Um, but yeah, I, the biggest thing for me is I would want the logo and the name changed. Also, just with these teams in general is, I doubt this will happen, but you know, maybe I'm being pessimistic, but I would want to have a team like uh, you know, Washington's football team and Cleveland's baseball team and maybe Chicago's hockey team too. I would want them to recognize like, hey, we've done some damage to the stereotype of Native Americans. Um, I don't know if that will happen. I hope it will because I think that's really important to recognize, but I don't know. I would like to see the, especially the logo and the team name change, personally. Brandon, thoughts? Uh, I think eventually it will happen. I think, I think maybe 30 years down the line, it'll definitely be changed. I don't know when it'll happen specifically. But personally, um, if it offends people, then go for it. Then definitely go for it because that, that's definitely a good enough motivation to do it. But if it's just – if the people at the picks have no problem with it, then there isn't a huge reason to do it. I wouldn't be against it. But I, I'm for doing it if there is some legitimately positive change from it. Right. I think a lot of it stems from just having conversations with Native American people about, okay, like, is this still something that you accept? Does this offend you? Um, obviously, the Washington football team's name needed to be changed. That was obviously a very different situation. Um, but in terms of teams like the Blackhawks, I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. Obviously, with a lot of sports teams with Native American background names uh, in question at the moment. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Thank you for a fantastic conversation on the NHL. Um, thank you guys for watching, all of you viewers. Um, on behalf of Liam Plate, our producer, this has been Pirate TV's NHL Restart Show. NHL, August 1st, get excited. Until next time, thank you.